Change the Game. Proudly brought to you by the QCCS Mackay Cutters. Hi everyone, welcome to QCCS Mackay Cutters Change the Game Vodcast podcast. I'd like to acknowledge the UWE people of the Kulin Nation and pay much respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Today we are joined on um, this episode by Grant Ravalli. He is previous Mackay Cutters captain, uh, local man now living down in Brisbane. Uh, today, Grant, we're going to talk about transition plan is our title and we'll go through a little bit of your journey through football, the pathway here in Mackay and then um, how you've built towards where you are now with your career. So welcome. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having me. Anyways, that was, um, we kind of did three cuts before we, we got to this point of um, out of current out of the environment upstairs. We're in the, the bunker downstairs here in the stadium and um, I'm really looking forward to our chat today. That's good. I'm worried about the lights here on the top of our heads, mate. It might be nice and shiny for, for the audience today. Same, same. <laughs> I think that's been a little bit of the off put at the start, but we're away and um, we'll see how we go. But pretty much I want to um, understand a little bit of your upbringing, Mackay, your footy journey. Um, and first thing I want to ask is what was your dream as a kid? What did you want to be when you grew up or growing up? Yeah, in terms of very proud of where I come from, um, born and bred in the Mackay region, grew up on, on a farm out at Walgerston uh, with the family. So very strong links to, to rugby league in Mackay. You know, my dad's always been involved um, through West as a junior and, and um, you know, through to South when we moved into town for school. So very proud of where we come from. And like I said, rich history in, in rugby league. So naturally... For me, I was always super interested in doing that. Um, you know, I was probably at school more for the social uh, interactions than more of the learning side of things. So, yeah, that was a there was a point for me. You know, in and around that time, I wasn't a naturally gifted player, and I didn't make any of the rep teams. You know, I wasn't a superstar as a kid. I made my first rep team was a Mackay under 15. So that that'll give you a fair idea of of where I was at at that time. And it was really interesting. I, I still remember this to this day. And I, I think I've said this to a couple of people or when I've spoken at, at different schools or at different occasions, there was a point where I was sitting in assembly at Mercy College and, and then I wrote a, you know, a super visualization technique that I didn't actually know about at that point. But I drew a, a Cowboys jersey with a number seven on the back and I just thought that you know, at that point, I would do everything in my power to be able to make that a, that dream a reality, really. And if you think about where I was at that period of time, you know, I I, I, I probably just made my first rep, Mackay rep team, and I think I was on the bench. Um, so, you know, if people knew that, knew that at that time, they'd just be thinking, you got rocks in your head, mate, you, you're no chance. Um, so physically, I was always a little bit slower than the other kids to develop. I was very little, I was really small, um, but I had this dedication and absolutely worked my ass off that, from that point on to to make the dream a reality. And I can sit here and say that I've actually achieved it. Yeah, so uh, 94 games for in the NRL, which is really impressive. Um, War Warriors and Cowboys, the two clubs you played for, um, you know, not too many from you know, we've got a really proud history here in Mackay and um, you know, a lot of really good footballs have come through but to play um, 94 games you're up there with those guys that have achieved um, some really great success at the top level um, so from the, if we go back a step um, and go through the pathway from that 15s that you talked about into then getting recruited to the, the Roosters system um, yeah, it's a pretty successful time down there in in those um, Harold Mats and to play SG ball. I went straight into reserve grade. So to take a step back, I think during my junior junior days, that the Mackay Rugby League competition was really strong. You know, we spent a hell of a lot of time down at down at the seniors. Dad was coaching at that time and spent a lot of time in the dressing rooms and. You know, as a kid, I used to look up to the Mackay A graders. You know, there were some fantastic players during that era. Um, that was in and around 
I remember Collie Groskrich was coach of the, the rep teams and that was in and around the time before we were in the state league and they used to have the state cup competition and, and Mackay were, you know, underdogs to a certain extent but had a lot of success during that period of time. So, you know, that was probably the start of, for, for me, looking at those types of players and, you know, mirroring how they played and watching them play rather than watch the guys on TV, if that makes sense. And, okay. So who were some of those role models? Oh, you know, Chubby Herring from, was, was a halfback at West at the time. Richie Irlandis was, was a halfback at, at Brothers. So those two guys in, in themselves were, you know, they're legends of the Mackay League. Um, you know, Richie's from the area. Uh, Chubby was from from down south but spent a stack of, stack of time here and playing playing really well and playing at an elite level. So... You know, as a, as a young halfback, I sort of watched those guys go around and both really skillful, skillful in their own right, but equally as tough. I think if you reflect on what Mackay Rugby League and the Mackay Town's about, it's built on that resilience and toughness and hard working and, you know, think about the history of the cutters itself and, you know, the, the cane and industry and then the coal industry, and that represents that, I think, so... I think the the players from here actually represent the history of of the town in that regard and you know certainly that's something that i looked at as a young fella coming through and i know a lot of the people that that i came through with were certainly products of that environment i, I believe anyway yeah definitely um so yeah, anyway anyway from that period of time i was lucky enough to go into the Intertech junior program at the cowboys and you know, there was a couple of guys that, that we sort of developed and went through that program. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to go to the Cowboys and play reserve grade straight away. And then from that point, went to the Roosters and, and went from there. Yeah, okay. Um, and then what about your time at the Roosters? What were some things down there that um, you have definitely learnt and then have probably set you up to, you know, where you went to next? Oh, I tell you what, it was a shock to the system. It felt like... It felt like I was talking a different language down there <laughs> to the rest of the other people. You know, I was, I was a kid from North Queensland and, you know, the slang and, and the terminology that we use up here and, I don't know, it feels like we speak a different language at times and we talk a lot slower and all those types of things. <laughs> that was a bit of a shock to the system. Even people, you know, asking where you come from, it's like, oh, I come from Mackay and they, they're like, oh, well, that's near Brisbane, isn't it? No, no, it's another 10 hours north. Um, so, yeah, it's it's different from a you know, view of the world. And, you know, coming from Mackay to Townsville and then into a, a city like Sydney is completely different in terms of getting around and, you know, living and those experiences that, that you learn. It's probably the, the, the most, well, the, the quickest part of growing up, really. Um, at, at the Cowboys, I was literally down the road from mum and dad. So I still had those support structures in and around me, whereas you move to Sydney and it's like you're, you're kind of on your own. And, um, and that was probably the best thing that happened for me in, in growing up and, and uh, learning the ways of the world, that's for sure. Dif a lot different from Mackay and Townsville compared to Sydney. So, you know, those were steep learning curves, but, but I think they helped me along the way. You know, when I went down there, I... I that was literally after the Roosters had won the 2002 competition. So, you know, I remember flying down there and, and um, Shannon Hegarty picked me up from the airport, you know, a Mackay guy. So they kind of, you know, he was my mentor, whether that was a good thing or not, not sure, but had some learnings through that period as well. And they were literally still parting from the grand final success, really. So, um, you know, I sort of rode on the back of that for the first couple of weeks and that was a little bit scary, but, you know, we got into training and, you know, Ricky Stewart was the coach at that time. And if you ref if I think about reflections of, you know, development points or those inflection points in my career, that was certainly one of those points that I think made a big difference in terms of me playing halfback and being a leader of the team. Ricky Stewart's probably the best person to learn off and, and he's one of those guys that, actually runs a club just like a local club here in Mackay. If I, you know when I got down there I just felt like this is how it's at the local club in, in Mackay at South you know all the teams train together um, all the A graders know the the junior players and there's a real connection there and Ricky Stewart 
that was a focus point for him and um, that made a big difference in my career because he spent a lot of time with me in those early stages and you know there's a real difference between playing as a halfback as a junior and then leading a team around of, of men um, when you go into that environment completely different and um, Ricky Stewart certainly taught me how to lead a team and, and um, you know, lead a team of forwards around and actually execute a game plan and all those types of things that go with it. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, what you've sort of said before, I want to um, go back a little bit and question you a little bit more on that too. When you were sitting on the bench as that sort of 15-year-old um, and, you know, you had that ambition and the dream to be at the highest level um, when you drew that picture, what were some of the things when you do reflect back that were the difference between maybe some, some of the others that the halfback on the field who was um, starting, that you know you went one way and they might have went another way? Were there some of the things that you actually did back then that... Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people would think it's down to the technicalities of the game and skills and, and those things. Yeah, there was certainly some refinement during that period of time um, in that regard, but it was more around getting serious with training and preparation and um, you know I was lucky enough that that dad has really switched on in that area so yeah I just I spent a lot of time on like that was sort of that time when I started to get into um, a bit of gym stuff we had some equipment at home and so I started to to um, work on my physique and as I said before I was naturally a pretty small kid so I developed later on so I, I got serious around my preparation and um, that was probably the difference of that period of time and, and through that period of time I made a hell of a lot of sacrifices you know as a 15 year old kid 16 year old you go through that transition of growing up and there's those external pressures from your friends to go to parties and you know which is fine but if you want to be serious and you want to progress and you need to make sacrifices and I absolutely did that at that period of time. Yeah, some good lessons in there for some of our probably juniors at the moment that might be in similar situations um, here at the Cutters. So you got to the Warriors. Um, when did you start thinking about your life after football? Like, had you already thought about, <coughs> sorry, that at the Roosters and, and kind of put some things in place? Or did you really invest in that at the um, when you got to New Zealand? Look, at the, at the Roosters, I was still only really young, 20, 21. We'd won a prim, couple of premierships, played in grand finals. I was a captain of those when I was really young. So I was literally having a great time during that, that period, which, mm -hmm. which you need to do and you need to learn. And again, if I reflect back, you don't realise how actually how close you are to the NRL during that period of time. I just had this feeling when I was at the Roosters that Brett Finch was in front of me, Brad Fittler, Craig Wing, you know, all these big names. And I was only actually one injury away from playing and I actually got selected in that period of time and got told I was going to play and it didn't work out at the back end of the week that those players came back and played. But, you know, I was I was just really enjoying myself. So what there was any, wasn't any, you know, motivation or any thought about you know transition to retirement that time i was really focused on trying to get to the nrl and play my dream really and i was just putting so much energy into that so once i got over to new zealand um you know there was a there was an opportunity to play nrl there and even just in that pre-season you know i just went over there for a chance and and i trained really really hard to be able to give myself an opportunity and even sort of round one or before that i wasn't actually considering that i was going to play so played really well in the trials and ivan said you're going to play this week and i was actually i was genuinely surprised that i was going to play so you know once you play and and then get into the games and you start to you know get a bit more experience and you know, at that time, the Warriors were probably a little bit more proactive than some of the other clubs because in that period of time was really the beginning of the NRL focusing on transition and the importance of players having something outside of outside of rugby league. Mm -hmm. um, so Ivan used to bring, you know, external parties to come in and, and run financial financial sessions with us around, you know, investments and the opportunities to 
because we were getting paid quite well to be able to set yourself up and have a focus outside of football. So they were, they were really proactive in that space at that time. And, um, you know, they we had a partnership with the university over there as well. So I started some university studies there. And um, so that was kind of the beginning of, of actually having a separate focus outside of football, which before that point was literally getting to the NRL performance, you know, making sure that I was on for the weekend and doing everything I could around that at that time. So what year did the university stuff happen for you? It was around 2006. Yeah. And so was it more club driven and help and support with that or was it more on your own too? No, no, it was very club driven. So they had the, the lecturers come into the club on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. There was a group of about 10 of us that went through that process and um, you know, it was a great experience and, and I wish I had actually gone through and completed that, but there was, you know, in that time I, I left the Warriors and went to the Cowboys, so I couldn't actually do that. But, you know, I think of someone that actually went through that process now, Michael Luck is, is now the, you know, the head of football in, in, in the, at the Cowboys and he actually finished that study period and then went and did his masters. And then as a result, he's gone along and, and done really well after football. So. You know, if I think about, as I said before, I think the Warriors were really proactive in that space at that time, and Ivan, I know that Ivan was really big and influential um, in that process. Mm. Yeah, it's really good to hear. So it was coach-driven yeah. amongst the group, and you know, that, that's really powerful for, the, for you guys going through and having that support from the coach. Yeah, that's, I think that's one of Ivan's strengths is he he's really good around the, the well-being of the players and... Yeah, he's you know he's a coach like any any other coaches that are focused on trying to have success for the club, but I think Ivan's one of Ivan's strengths that is he really gets to know the individuals and what what makes them tick and I guess from his experiences when he was playing football he was really good around you know implementing that for the players that he led as well. Mm -hmm. So then. Um, further study other than so what was that course that you went into. It was a business business degree, yeah. so um, you know I think for for me I didn't finish it, but it certainly turned the light on at that stage to say, well, I enjoyed that, um, and that was a sort of you know like I said, turned the light on for me to start thinking about well what what would I like to do when I when I finished mm -hmm. when Did I finished playing football, and that was probably the point for me that I started to I got right into um you know reading and reading quite regularly and um creating a bit of a habit around that as well and um had a fair bit of sort of exploration in that time of um you know a, a life coach as well outside of the club so um you know again i've had some good support structures through my career with my wife being there for most of it and, and dad who are both pretty switched on and in around that area so um, they were always very encouraging to explore other opportunities outside of the club. So, you know, I think the the uni thing was a kind of a bit of a moment for me to, to think about things a little bit differently outside of just the day-to-day um, -day performance in the NRL because, you know, there was some times there when we had some success and I had early success. First couple of years, it went really well. And then, as you do, there's periods in your career where, you, you know, your form wavers for whatever reason. And if you are so focused in on the day-to-day -day football and you don't have any other any other areas to to um, outlet outlet yeah for sure, then that becomes a bit of a challenge. You know, it feels mm. like the the whole world's caving in on you. And it's that's absolutely not the case. So um, I think those that experience with the uni and then also you know life coaching there as well um, were good opportunities for me to to explore other avenues and have an outlet outlet outside of footy. Yeah, great. And then you would have probably seen and been exposed to too that others who you were you know, teammates with you know, might have gone down a different road as, as well that didn't deal with the stress as well or didn't put the effort and the work in the study or in a personal coach as an example. Or, um, yeah, Did you see some of that that probably didn't use that time as wisely? Yeah, and if, on the positive side of that, at that time we had a, a – a good group of senior players that were really invested in their own personal development outside of football anyway. Yeah. So they're great role models. Role models, yeah. So I lived with Toddy Byrne when I first went to New Zealand and he was always 
studying something or doing something external from from football and for for toddy it was like football was a complete bonus and that was a good opportunity for him to focus on the things that he wanted to do which mm. is really bizarre right you know mm. i was the reverse like all i want to do is play footy whereas toddy's just a completely different kettle of fish where he's he's from you know he has that footy's a bonus type thing and i want to do these things so he he was um, really focused in on investments. He was um, studying to be a teacher as well. So, um, you know, I lived with him and, and watched him. Nathan Fien was another one. Tony Martin's another one. So those guys were senior players that were really invested outside of football. So they, they was good role models for me. And, you know, complete stark to some of the other guys that were completely focused on um, you know, football during that time. One really bad example is probably Sione Famoina, who's been up through here and tells some great stories now about his experiences through that period of time. He had a lot of dramas outside of football and he was so focused on, you know, the on-field stuff. And when injuries came and he, he became off track and, you know, got involved with, with the wrong side, of, wrong side of, you know, alcohol and whatever, whatever else. So... Yeah, there were some good examples of, of people to follow and some some bad examples of, you know, how it can go wrong. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then at the Cowboys, um, talk us through a little bit of that experience um, in, in that system and also, you know, the work you're doing behind the scenes and, and footy too. Of, um, little, don't have to go too deep into it, but what were the, some of the main differences between the Warriors and the Cowboys? Yeah, it was a different time for the Cowboys at that stage. They were probably going through a bit of a transition themselves. It was towards the end of Neil Henry's time there. So we didn't have, we had success early on when I first came back to the, the Warriors. And, you know, as I mentioned before, I, I wrote the the Cowboys jersey. So when I got to wear the jersey, that was a, a life, you know, it was a dream come true. Like, mm. you know, the, the experience of debuting was great, but then once I got to play for the Cowboys, it was really weird. It was like, you know, I've, I've actually complete, I've done what I wanted to do. And like I said, I'm a proud North Queenslander. You know, I've always supported the Cowboys, even through the tough times when they came to the competition, but they're just down the road. So, you know, that was a great moment for me personally, but, you know, um, we had success earlier on, but then it was, it was a real, real challenging period through that sort of 09, 2010, um, for the Cowboys and for a number of players in that and um, some really key learnings for me around leadership and, and team and because we had a lot of challenges uh, through that period on the field which was reflected off the field because of the, the structure and the, of the playing group and you know I think during that period the coaches would reflect and think we probably could have done things a little bit better and same with the players as well so you know, for me, it was it was it was coming towards the back end. I think I was about 27, 28 at that period of time, um, and that's when it really was sort of hitting home around that transition. I kind of lost the focus of off the field stuff. Um, there was, you know, what my wife and I had. Lola, she's born in 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 New Zealand, um, so. Lauren was sort of seven months pregnant when Ivan sort of called me in and said, mate, um, you know, I think we should go our separate ways. I still had another two years on my contract at, at the Warriors. And, you know, thankfully, Ivan was really open and, and upfront with me during that period because I could have just stayed there and, and sort of rotted in, in reserve grade type, type thing. But mm. we always had a solid relationship that, you know, at that time, he just thought it would be better for the club and better for me if, if I went somewhere else. So... You know, we end up signing at the Cowboys during that period of time. And I actually started the preseason at the Warriors. So I did the first block of preseason at the Warriors, even though I was signed at the Cowboys. And because Lauren was pregnant with Lola during that period and we couldn't actually travel. So we had Lola traveled to Townsville. Um, Lola was like, you know, three or four weeks old and we jumped on the plane back over here. Um, so there, there were some challenges wow. in that as well. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And everyone knew, like everyone knew at the Warriors at that time, you had signed with the Cowboys. and Yeah, they were really, really supportive. Good. Yeah, they were great through that period. Um, I've said on a couple of these podcasts before, uh, you know, I look back at that. And it was a challenge during that time, but the Warriors were fantastic through that process. Um, really supportive and, 
you know, as, as smooth as possible. And the Cowboys were the same when we got over. That was, that was, that was really good. So back to my initial uh, where I was going with this is that extra responsibility of, you know, family there. And um, you just started to have an impact towards that 2010 period. I had a two-year contract. But performance was up and down during that period. Actually, and this is the truth, I actually preferred to come back here and play here rather than playing first grade. Now, that's not a good sign mm. when you're there to play first grade. So, you know, there was some things happening at the club during that period of time. We, you know, on the field, was we weren't going well. There was a lot of things off the field that weren't, wasn't going well. The culture of the place wasn't wasn't where it should have been as well. And, and the playing group were fully aware of that. The coaches were aware of that as well. And you know, in that, in, in the end, that resulted in Neil moving on, but, um, I was still in that period. So, you know, that coupled with the responsibility of, you know, a family and, and, um, yeah, it was really, it was a really challenging time. And, and it's probably one of those things where, you know, I was lucky enough to have some really good solid support around me, some support structures around me to be able to get through that period. But, that was really the trigger for me to say, you know what, um, there's a lot more to to life than than professional footy, um, and we made a decision to to come back to Mackay. I had a, an opportunity to go to the UK Super League, but you know I, I just probably had enough really of the of the pressure and um, pressure around performance, and it wasn't. It was more of this the personal pressure that you put put on yourself. It wasn't actually from the club or anyone else. Yeah. It's the, the pressure that you put on yourself to be able to perform. And that can be a good thing, but that can be a bad thing as well. And, um, yeah, it, that was the real driver for me to, to actually choose to, to come back and, and um, go down a different path. So, you know, I was lucky enough that, that Lauren's really well educated and, and gone to university and, and um, had, a, had a good job. And, um, you know, we, we literally followed her back here um, she had a good opportunity to work at Porter's and it'd be the HR leader there and, and that's the reason why we came back so um, yeah, there's a fair bit in that in that period of time it was quite challenging but if I look back now there was, a, there was a lot of learnings through that period about you know myself and what was important mm. and then um, you've come back to the cutters and um, captained with Jardine yeah, you probably you were able to still get the team environment and your footy fix, I guess, too, and didn't go straight to retirement. Um, so, do you think you know that slow um, transition from professional footballer into semi-professional footballer, in, and then you went to play for South for a couple of years after that, um, was a good sort of progression to still stay involved in footy with your passion and your love, um, you know, rather than you're probably never going to quit. And go, or were you? I'm not sure. Were nah, you? no, I was never going to quit. I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't really going to quit. I just, it was more about at the end of the Cowboys, kind of done at that level. Um, just worn, completely worn out. So, really, just wanted to have a break. Um, so the plan was to come back here. Lauren had a great job. So you know, I was just going to have a bit of a, a break, and but I didn't. Like Graham Walker rung me and. Um, I started at Aon a week after and that's probably that was probably one of the great things that happened because I, mm. I didn't come back and do nothing and, and get you know get in a, in bad habits I just went f pretty much straight from the field straight into work so there was no no opportunity for me to be idle if that makes sense so so how did that opportunity come about is that a connect a personal connection yeah, so Graham, Graham Walker was my coach at South um, from under 13s through to under 18s. Um, we've been family friends forever. Mm -hmm. He knew I was coming back here. I literally was, I did a couple of job interviews before I came back here and um, Lauren's in HR, so I was very well prepared for those for what, those interviews. So. And do you mind, what were they? What did you want to do? Did you have any idea? I don't have any idea, no. I just wanted to, I guess I, I knew that I had a good network. Um, so, and I really enjoyed the relationship side of things. Like I really enjoyed going to networking events when I was a player. So, yeah. um, 
and I, I made a, an effort during those during that time of you know at the cow wasn't the worries of of knowing the businesses and the support, the sponsors of of the club and because I, I think that was really important um that was part of our role as a player right is to, yeah. to make sure that those guys put their hard earned up for us so we can actually get paid so and that you represent the club really well in those situations yeah that's right so i really enjoyed that environment um so I, I felt like well i've got some skills there you know that's kind of where my head was at and like how do, how can i utilize those skills um to go into an environment where i can do those things but mm -hmm. the other thing that was in the back of my mind i just had this i had this desire to continue on in football in some way give back or go coaching and so I'd actually looked at the development role when I first came back, the, the development role in Mackay. NRL. Yeah, NRL yep. development. Um, you know, that didn't work out for whatever reason. And Graham rang and said, you know, do you want a job? And then I literally started the week after. So HR called me about 15 minutes after that conversation and started having a phone interview. And I had to apologize to the lady and said, look, I'm not prepared for this at all. I don't even know who Aon is. I don't even know what who, what Graham does. <laughs> so, you know, I spent the weekend um, researching the business and done some, you know, done some research in preparation for the meeting, did the meeting on Monday, and then I had the job Friday. And then I started at Aon the week after, and I'm, I'm still here 12, 12 years later. Then reflect back to that first week, if you can, or the first year, what, what was it like, you know, being a professional footballer in, in the locker room to then you know, wearing a you know, business attire? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was I was pretty nervous the first day. I was like I was, you know, the first day you walk into a dressing room or walk, walk into school, you don't know what to expect. Like I literally had not I didn't know what to expect because I hadn't had a job mm. since I left school. Like I did part-time stuff in Sydney to supplement my income. I worked at a bar and, you know, a couple of days a week, but but nothing from a you know, formal corporate environment. Business. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, I've not actually thought about that, but yeah, I was yeah, relatively nervous, but I had some relationships there. I knew Graham well, so I knew that I'd be looked after and it wouldn't be, um, you made know, it easier. Held. yeah, that's right. So it made it easier. The relationship part made it easier. And, you know, the people in the business at the time were fantastic as well. They didn't make a big deal out of it because I'm not that type of person anyway. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I literally just had this mindset that. I just wanted to get my head down and work work hard again, very similar to how I, you know, approach football. And So were there some of the skills that you were able to transfer from football into the business, the life after football, your work? Yeah, absolutely. I think I still rely on that now. Yeah, things that, that you've taught in that professional environment around good habits, preparation, discipline, still rely upon that now um, the skills around teamwork as i said before you know leading a team getting a team around the field can be a lot easier than leading a team in the office environment that's for sure so yeah. um, i had a lot of confidence you know once i got in there i had a lot of confidence that the experience that i had during my playing career you know if i made a mistake on the field and i still think about this now if i make a mistake on the field depending on where you're playing if you're playing at suncorp fifty thousand people see that and then probably whatever the the audience on tv is if i make a mistake now i'm the only one that potentially could know about it and mm. i'm filthy on myself for that yeah but no one else really knows so that gave me a little bit of confidence you know as i went through and as I said before, some of those things that you, th you take for granted in your professional sporting um, environment, I just focused on those things. So, you know, discipline, preparation, hard work. Yeah. I knew how to um, interact with a, with a group of people. I, know, I knew how to form teams and relationships. And then, as I said earlier on, I was always really good in that networking environment from a sponsor's point of view. And you know, that's, that's, that's um, set me up really well in the business that I'm in now. So, and what were some of the challenges? So those were some of the, the easier things that you found to be able to be transferred, but what were some of the challenges? The ch I think the challenges for me was you, you go from an environment, a professional sporting environment where everybody there, you know what they're, everybody's there to, to succeed and win and do their absolute best on a, 
day-to-day basis. If you're not prepared to do that, then you just don't last. Mm. You know, it's very cutthroat. But in that, you have a lot of motivated so, people. And that's players right through the staff, yep. so from CEO right through to the water boy. Yep, Get that's on. exactly right. Yep. So everybody's there to win, everybody's there to be successful, and everybody's there to, to make sure that the team's performing well. Completely different in a working environment. Mm. You've got so many different personalities. You've got so many different motivations. You know, there's some people there that, yeah, they want to progress and they want to progress their career and they want to get better every single day. There's other people there that just want to get their job done and they want to be left alone and that's completely fine as well. So mm. I think early on for me, it was that was a, one of the big challenges to actually recognise that, you know what, Johnny it's in different. the corner can just do his job and he can go along sort of mediocre and that's completely fine and, you know, he's going to do that and you know sally over here wants to progress and so there's just this real different in speeds of mm. where people want to go so that was probably one of the things early on that i just was i couldn't understand i couldn't get my head around i was like what you know what's what is wrong with these people what don't, what don't they want to do their best or you know and and how long did it take do you think to be comfortable with that within your role yeah it took a while yeah 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 yeah, yeah it took a while like it, years Oh, probably, probably a good year, a good year, a, yeah, a good year. But at the same time, that just gave me a lot of confidence mm. that if I had the commitment that I had when I was playing, that I, that I would be successful at, you know, if I enjoyed what I was doing, um, then I could, could apply the same attitudes to work that I would have success. Yeah. Uh, run us through how you've climbed the corporate ladder from coming into the position you came into. I'm not sure what that was to you know, the position you're in now. Yeah, it's been a pretty swift, pretty swift rise, yeah. um, but it's been really enjoyable. So, you know, I came into the business at what is a junior broker. So at Aon, we were risk advisors. So in that, there's a, there's a, a broad scope of of um, what we provide. So in the segment that I work in, where our core business is, is insurance broking, so for commercial businesses. So if you're a commercial mm. business, you come and talk to us. We talk about the risks in your business and, and we um, transition those risks for you with the insurance market. That's basically what we do. Um, so I came in, I was a junior broker. Um, I was given a portfolio of clients in that construction space, which suited me really well because I had a lot of connections in that space. And as yeah. I said before, I I was good on the relationship side of things. So that's what I focused on. And in a business like us, we've got we're a global organisation, so we've got a lot of technical experience um, experts. So if I didn't have the answer, then I could find the answer within two minutes. So um, I had that approach through the whole process, really. And so I've gone from, you know, junior broker into, you know, a senior broker into running the branch here in Mackay into um, regional director for South East Queensland. So what that means is leading pretty much from Bundaberg through to Byron Bay and that Northern Rivers region. So we sort of have six locations in that. And mm -hmm. um, the last 11, or 11 months, so I've been, been promoted into the Queensland Northern Territory Director. So leading the business from Darwin all the way through to Byron Bay and that Northern Rivers. So we've wow. got about 13 locations that sit in there and there's about 85 people in that. And so you, a you know, lot of- 85 kind of- direct report to you? No, I've got 15 direct reports to me. So the managers report yeah. through to me and, and then the brokers and the people rep report through to them. Yeah. That's great. And how do you, have you come in and um, go into the Aon management system and style or do you bring your own management style to, you know, those 15 that report to you? Do you run it differently to another director in another area? Good thing about our business is it's really diverse business with, with, with the leaders that sit in there. So I'm lucky enough in the position that I'm in, I'm on the leadership team for the business nationally. And so there's there's six of us that, that sit on that. And all of those people have got a diverse background and experience and leadership and, and all those types of things. So we share the knowledge within, within the group. And when we are running the Queensland business, I say, say we, um, yeah, it's my responsibility, but the rest of the leaders and myself, we do it together. Yeah. So I really take that sort of collegian team approach, you know, clearly from the background that I have. And, you know, again, the leaders that I get to work with from a day-to-day -day perspective, all of those got people have got, 
you know, their own superpowers and their own strengths. And I learn from them and, you know, hopefully they learn from me and hopefully they learn from the mm. other guys. So it really is a team approach to, to the business um, because the collective, it's about the collective minds, you know. I, I don't have all the ideas and I'm yeah. not pretending that I do, but the, the certainly the, the strength of the group is, you know, what we rely upon to be able to lead that, that business because it is a, is it a pretty big one. Yeah, definitely. And has that been different to your experience with how other managers managing you or has it been pretty similar? Yeah, I think I think I probably just bring a different approach. Um, you know, like I said, from from my background, I have seen and I've been lucky enough to, to play under a lot of great leaders, you know, Steve Price, Ruben Wickey, um, Ricky Stewart, Phil Gould, Ivan Cleary, um, you know, Neil Henry, Greeny coached me in residence. So just from that, that those names right there, there's a lot of experience and leadership and I've seen the bad and the good of that. And I think if I use the analogy of sort of that filter, I've been quite good at filtering out for me what's important and what's important to my values and I, I certainly try and utilize you know those experiences along with the the leaders that i've had in that transition period when i've come into aon i've worked with a lot of great leaders and still work with a lot of great great leaders in the business as well so i just try to filter out the good um, that aligns with my values and, and where i want to head as a leader to be able to implement that with the group of people that i work with yeah perfect um, what's the connection with the Cowboys that Aon have at the moment? Yeah, it's it's um, we're we're it's a proud connection. So we're community partners. So we started off with the Try for Five program. We've been doing that for the last couple of years, and you know it's a great program up there where they focus on you know kids getting into school and participating, and um, they reward the kids for for going along to to the school. So we we were attendance. part of that program attendance. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we were part of that program for the last couple of years and then um, you know we're going into a different area of the of the program moving forward which, ha which ha hasn't actually been launched yet so oh, you them. nearly got me to say <laughs> <laughs> but, no, keep um, an eye out yeah yeah so keep an eye out for that um, we're really excited about about the next phase of our partnership with the Cowboys but it is a, it is a community aspect I think that's really important for us if you think about the the Cowboys brand, you know, you guys are a part of that as well. And, and the regions that it touches, it's there's a lot of alignment with the, the regions that we touch. And so that's really important for us. And um, that's part of the reasons why I'm here at the moment. We're, we're doing a function with the Cowboys today where the, the, the business leaders come in and talk about resilience and teamwork and what that means for the Cowboys and, and how you can Im implement that in your business as well. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, no doubt it'll be a great event. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your time at the, here at the Cutters. Um, as mentioned, previous captain, and I think last we had Jardine Babongi on an episode not too long ago, and he talked about um, his time as captain and learned a lot of you when he was able to share that responsibility. And what I wanted to ask you, what were some of the things you reckon Jars learnt from you? Oh, I don't know. I'm surprised he said that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he learned how to captain a, prem a team to a premiership. I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, no, you definitely um, laid the foundation for it in 2013. But for that time between um, when you got um, back to the Cutters, because um, you were, play as you said, you were at the Cowboys and coming back and playing and then come into hit at the state league level more full time. Um, what are some of the things that you bought differently and set this club up for su success? Oh, I loved it. I was really proud to run out, you know, that first time as Carter's captain back here full time. It was, it was a little bit different because I was sort of back and forth. But when, when I came back here, I just felt like you're representing what's gone before. And as I mentioned really earlier on in the conversation about the players that, that I saw come through this region and we have a proud mm. history. There's a Seagulls. Lot, yeah, there's a lot of players that have gone on to bigger things and there's a lot of players that didn't get the opportunity to go on to bigger things than they could have. And, and I think the Cutters is a representation of all those people that have gone before us. So that was one of the, a real proud moment for me to be able to captain the club and, and being from the area and knowing the sacrifice of a lot of people to actually get this up and running. Um, so it was a real proud moment. And I, I loved my time playing in, in the Q Cup. 
probably one of the things that I enjoyed most is, is playing with people like Jardine. Like, I've known Jardine pretty much most of my, you know, life in, in terms of he was a younger year younger than me at South in the juniors. Um, you know, I got to play with him and Luke Fat I was at the Roosters with Luke Fats and, uh, again, another Mackay boy. And so that they were probably, you know, I got to play with my brother as well. And they were probably the moments, if I think back, that are the that gave me a lot of joy, you know, because there was a good mix of local guys in the team, guys that have gone away and come back, but guys that have come through the system mm. and got an opportunity to play at state league level and then go on to the Cowboys. And, um, yeah, there was a real good mix of local guys and then people that we brought in, brought into the system. And I think, think back those, you know, the pride of representing the community and then also um, being able to help young guys come through and progress. I think those two are the things that I really enjoyed. Yeah, so those years, there was definitely evidence of um, success or in the ingredients for success were building. Um, and then you stepped away the 2000, end of 2012-13 season went to South. Um, you, your dad, Troy, was manage, uh, football manager there and, and again, you guys... Um, where I would have success together there. That would have been a proud moment for you. Yeah, it was great. It was good to go back there. And, and well, I, essentially, I played most of my junior football at South, so that was important to me. Um, I was I was actually going to stop playing that year. It was at that sort of time where work was work was always really important, but it mm. was at that time when I was, you know, I was starting to progress through the business and I was get, getting more responsibility at work. So... Um, the challenge of semi-professional here and work plus a young family wasn't working out for me. So I made the smart decision mm -hmm. um, at the time to was naturally to spend more time at home with the family. And, and um, you know, I, I probably got a little bit of itchy feet and then dad's kind of in my ear, ear at the same time. And So you didn't do pre-season? No, I, I, I started pre-season late because I, I, sort of, I sort of thought oh, I'll just go down there and and see how I go. If I like it, then I'll hang around. And yeah, obviously I liked it because I hung around for three years. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, but again, the things that I spoke about before about, you know, playing, playing back in the local competition with a lot of people that were from, from even guys that I grew up with. So Adam Walker, we, we grew up playing in juniors together. We played A grade together through that whole period and won grand finals. And, you know, they, they were they were pretty cool moments as well. Mm. And um, the kids were at that age at that time where they could actually, you know, come down and, and sort of understand what was going on. And yeah, put a South jersey on and yeah. put a South jersey. Yeah, yeah so that around. was pretty cool because that's what I did. I was always on the sideline watching Dad play. I was always ball boy. I was always there. And um, so that was really cool from a family perspective because, you know, Dad was there and, and my kids and um, Josh ended up coming over and playing as well. So... Yeah, that was a that was a pretty cool time, but it was bloody challenging. That that competition in those days was mm. was tough, and and I actually really struggled early on. Like it was just because of the different pace between Q Cup, you know, NRL Q Cup, and then locally. Yeah. And they give it to you. The blokes who they were into me. There was no <laughs> there was no favors given. That's for sure. I, I found it really tough, and which was a great it was a great experience, a really good experience. Yeah. And then what brought you back for a year, 2016, here at the Cutters? Uh, your dad was uh, leading the club, and um, did he pull you back in, or what was the catalyst for you to have well, another year? Well, I was on the board. So um, before dad came in, I was asked to, to come on the board at the Cutters, and I, I thought that was a huge honour to be asked for one. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't actually know what I was getting myself into, but I, I loved my time as, as a you know board member at the, at the club. And you know, it, it really is getting your hands dirty. You know, you're coming down here and setting up and, you know, setting up for concerts and picking up rubbish and all that stuff. So I loved all that. But, you know, we I think that period of time we went through some issues on the field in terms of injuries. Like we just had this stack of injuries for the first half of the year. And, mm -hmm. you know, I remember Jimmy Wilson, um, who was coach at the time, was and who I'm pretty close with. He's sort of saying to me, "Oh, I think you need to start coming down to train." And I was like, "Mate, no, I'm, you know, I'm in the, I'm in, I'm off with some boardroom. You know, I'm happy to help out anywhere, anywhere I can in the club." And I really enjoyed that. But yeah, it got to I think 
sort of 10 games to go and we were looking really slim on the field and we were getting some good cowboys back and and jimmy you know kept at me and i folded of course rubber arm and i'm so happy i did it i really enjoyed that back end of the season it was i'm really happy that i did that if i reflect back i think we had a lot of good players coming back from the Cowboys. I think we won sort of four out of the last six or something. And, you know, it was, it was good to finish off on that note. Um, and that was clear to me, as I said before, the local comp. It was actually a lot easier than the local comp. And that, that's, that's probably an example and, and, um, of how strong the local comp was at that time. And um, as I said before, you know, Greeny was coaching at the Cowboys, so I had pretty regular dialogue with him and... Yeah, so it was a pretty cool time. I really enjoyed that, but um, but yeah, I'm not coming back ever again. <laughs> <laughs> not even local. <laughs> no. 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 Very good. Um, probably what I want to finish with is: is there anything that you, um, you know, if you could give one piece of advice or information, you know, to a, an under 16s cutter, under 18 cutter, a Colts cutter, even a, um, a HPC cutter coming through? What would that advice be to them? That's always a really hard question. Um, I think I think if I think about my own experiences, if you if you have a goal in mind, that you've got to be prepared to make the sacrifices to actually get where you've got to go. I think that's a real difference with some of the younger people these days that they have a goal and the goal's there, but they're not concentrating on the systems to be able to get there. And it really is, it's not actually about the goal. So it's good to have a vision, but it's actually about the systems and processes to get you there. And I talk about sacrifices, you know, making sacrifices that, you know, your mates are going to not be happy with, but if that's going to get you where you need to go, then you absolutely need to be able to do that. So, and that's not easy, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, because there's a lot of things that you know going on, and you know, so that would be my advice: is that you know, have a clear goal, but have some clear systems and processes that are going to be able to get you there, and to be able to break down that goal, um, which will become a lot easier if you concentrate on those systems and processes to get you there. Yeah, definitely. Well, Ravs, Grant, really enjoyed our chat. Um, I think we've covered a lot of areas that would going to be um, great for the audience to listen to and um, hopefully a few of our guys can take something from listening to this as well. So appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me, mate. Always happy to help out the cutters. Cheers. Cheers. Change the game. Proudly brought to you by the QCCS Mackay Cutters.